Tonight we are going to be completing the second half of last Wednesday's message, which was titled, Beware of False Teachers. And this whole issue, this whole chapter really is a very serious, very intense, very critical warning against those who would misrepresent or falsify the truth of God. In chapter 1 of the second letter of Peter here, he has established the radical importance of the truth of God's Word, especially what God's Word says about who Jesus is, that he is God, not a God, not somebody's brother, he's God. What Jesus did as God, what the Word says, how he died for the sins of the whole world for all times especially what it says about what that means for us in regards to how we are saved. The grace we live under, the future hope that we have looking forward to eternity. It's very important. And so he established how, how, how important the truth of God's word is. And of course, he used his own eyewitness accounts to say, look, you know, I've seen Jesus glorified. He appealed to the prophets and he said, look, the word of God has spoken prophetically. It is verifiable. There are things that are verified to be written before the things that they prophesied happened, happened, right? He's like, it's trustworthy. But here in chapter two, he now spends this entire chapter pointing out how to identify false teachers and the judgment that will come on those who are false teachers. Last week, we mentioned that this, uh, the language here in this chapter is very harsh. It's very heavy. It's very critical. He describes false teachers. He says their waves are depraved. He says they are unrighteous. They despise authority. He calls them arrogant. He compares them to irrational animals. He calls them, he says they're like creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed. He calls them slanderers. He says which I just find funny, they are spots and blemishes. Right, you know how the Bible talks about when we're washed by the blood of Christ, we become blameless, we become spotless, you know, and he goes, yeah, but they are spots and blemishes. He says their eyes are full of adultery and their children under a curse. Heavy things, difficult things. Things that aren't necessarily for you guys, right? This is a tough chapter to, you know, if I was speaking to a room of false teachers, this would be an easy chapter to preach on because it's for them, you know? But you who are here, believers, Christians, children of God, you're like, it's not fun to watch God yell at someone else, you know? Um, but it's here for a purpose, and we can't forget that it's in God's word. We can't forget that, that this is the word of God. This is inspired by God himself, the Holy Spirit speaking through Peter, things that God wants us, his people, to know. These aren't just Peter's words. These aren't just Peter's opinions, but this is God speaking through Peter about how he feels about those who lie about him and teach lies to people who are trying to find God, trying to have a connection with God, those who lead people astray into false gospels. And so it's important for us to know this stuff because we need to be able to identify false teachers, right? And that's what we looked at last Wednesday, the, the five groupings of characteristics here in this chapter. But I do want to point out that as he is coming down really hard on false teachers, that doesn't mean that there isn't grace for ignorance. There is grace for ignorance, right? If you, as a brand new baby Christian, aren't well versed on theology and you say something wrong, God's not going to strike you down in that moment, right? <laughs> There's grace for ignorance. There's a place to be corrected. There's a place to learn. There's a place to grow. And we actually have an example of that in Acts chapter 18 with a man named Apollos. And it tells us there in Acts chapter 18 that he preached Jesus accurately, but he was a little bit off about baptism because he only knew about John's baptism, is what it tells, there, it tells us there in Acts 18. And so then it says that Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And then as we read and, and see his name mentioned in other places throughout the New Testament, we know that Apollos went on to be a wonderful force of truth in the early church. So there's grace for ignorance. 
There's allowance for repentance and correction. But when people know the truth, and they intentionally lie about it anyways, when they look at the truth of God's word and try and figure out ways to twist it and to change it, to go so far as to invent their own translations to say what they want to say about it, God's not happy about that at all. Those who know better, who know what the truth is and still twist it and teach lies, by misrepresenting it, by contradicting it, by saying it says things it doesn't say, especially about Jesus. Well, at the end of this chapter, we'll deal with that next Wednesday because Sunday is Mother's Day, and I don't want to spend Mother's Day with a false teachers are going to hell <laughs> message. So we're going we're gonna to come back next Wednesday. But what he says at the very end of this chapter is that those who know better and lie anyways, they're, they're, they're worse off. And they're standing before God <laughs> They're worse off than if they had never known the truth to begin with. Very heavy, heavy uh, statement there. And so last week I mentioned that in this first half of this chapter, there's three principles in dealing with false teachers. And the first one last week was to be alert to their fakery, right? Be alert. Be aware of who they are. Be able to identify them. Tonight we're going to be looking at the next two principles that I found in these first 14-ish verses of this chapter that really help us in dealing with false teachers, to help us be patient when it comes to false teachers, to help us not blow our witness when we're dealing with false teachers because it can be very frustrating when you hear people outright lying about God. And, you know, for me, sometimes I hear stuff people say and I, I just want to get angry and punch them in the face, but that's not a good witness, right? You, you, you want to you wanna not do that and be kind <laughs> and, and try and lead them to the truth. And so these, uh, these next two principles here we're going to be looking at tonight, one, about being sure of their future, Knowing what's coming to them helps us be patient in dealing with them here and now, and then really to help us to keep us from stumbling into false teaching, to be drawn away by false teachers. It's really the idea of being aligned with the faithful. So let's pray, and we'll get into it. Father, we thank you. We love you. Lord, your word is truth. We know it's truth. We proclaim it as truth. We claim it as the truth we live by, and Lord, yet we live in a world where there's false teachers. Lord, and as we learned last week, that it's nothing new. There's always been false teachers. There always will be false teachers. There are those who lie about God, lie about the Bible, lie about who Jesus is, lie about the means of salvation. And God, you are deadly serious about this issue because, God, a false gospel still leads to damnation. Lord, just because someone mentions the name, the word Jesus. God's not going to be like, oh, you're close enough. I'm going to let you into heaven. There's a very narrow gate that we're called to walk through, Lord, and a very narrow path that leads to salvation. Although that path is narrow, Lord, it is open to every single human being. But God, those who would dare lead your people, your creation astray, God, it's a serious, serious thing to consider. And so, Lord, help us to, to learn tonight, God, um, just how to be patient with false teachers in this world, Lord. There's time to stand up and speak against them. There's time to be gentle and try to lead them to truth. But more importantly, God, there is always time to let you deal with it because you're going to deal with it. And so, Lord, let us uh, be encouraged tonight um, as to what you're going to do and how that we, we would be able to avoid stumbling into false teaching and following false teachers, Lord. So, God, just uh, speak to us tonight. We love you so much. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, in the first, like, 14 verses of this chapter, um, over and over and over again through these verses, basically we see the fact that false teachers have a judgment that is severe, that is severe. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, There were indeed false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Verse 3, They will exploit you in their greed with made-up stories. Their condemnation, pronounced long ago, is not idle, and their destruction does not sleep. Verse 12, 
But these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, slander what they do not understand, and in their destruction, they too will be destroyed. Verse 13, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Serious judgment. Now, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, in the New King James Version, it reads this way, they will receive the wages of unrighteousness. Now, the word unrighteousness, it, it, it refers to wrongdoing. It refers to injustice. It refers to sin. And if you're a Bible student in the room today or online, you should know the answer to what the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. Death. The wages of sin. And God will make sure that the payday comes for false teachers and those who lie about God. Now, if you notice in those verses I pointed out, verse 1, verse 3, and verse 12, there was a word there that kept coming up, destruction. Their destruction will come swiftly. Their destruction does not sleep. In their destruction, they will be destroyed, right? Okay, God, you're trying to say something, right? What is he saying here? Well, in verses 1 and 3, the Greek word for destruction is different than the word for destruction in verse 12. There's two different words here that are translated destruction in the English. In verses 1 and 3, when he says they will bring swift destruction on themselves and their destruction does not sleep, that word in the Greek means to cause someone to be cut off entirely from what could or should have been. That's what the word destruction means. To cause someone to be cut off entirely from what could or should have been. The idea there is that they'll be condemned to hell forever. That they will be consigned to eternal misery. That they will be cut off entirely from what could have been salvation in paradise. Now in verse 1, he says that they will bring destructive heresies. The word destruction there is the same word. Talking about what these false teachers do that he's describing in this chapter the teaching that they they try and put out there, whether it's live in a pulpit or online or on social media or on YouTube, the teaching will cut people off from true salvation. That people who get caught up and adhere and believe these false teachers, they're being fed a false gospel. A gospel that doesn't lead to salvation. It's a destructive Heresy is what he's talking about here, and so we could see why God is so adamant about truth because it is a matter of life and death, literally. Now, in verse 12, it's a different word for destruction when he says, In their destruction, they too will be destroyed. So not only will will they bring destruction on themselves and cut themselves off forever from what could or should have been. But in verse 12, when it says destruction there, it's talking about a destruction from internal corruption, all right? It's the idea of rottenness, or the idea of decay, the idea of of decomposition or ruin. You could write it to say, in their ruin, they will be ruined, right? So as I was looking at that, I was like, okay, what does that remind me of? And then I thought of something. You know, when I was a kid, I had a really bad habit of drinking milk right out of the carton, right? Some of us still do this today. But when I was a kid, I would just, you know, run into the kitchen, pull up in the fridge, grab, and it was the big plastic, you know, one-gallon jugs, you know, and just pop the lid off and swig, 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 and put the lid back on, put it back in the fridge. And my mom would always tell me, don't do that. Don't do that. That's gross. But I just, it was too much work to get a glass, right? Well, one day you could probably guess what happened, right? Run into the kitchen, throw open the door, grab that gallon jug, rip the lid off of it, take a big swig of lumps. Disgusting. (laughs) Gross, right? Now, those milk jugs are like the perfect deception. Because from the outside, it still looks like milk. When I grab the jug, it it still mostly moves like milk, right? Especially if you're not paying close attention. And if you're not careful, gross, 
right? You take a swig of rotten, lumpy milk. And what do you do when that happens, if that's ever happened to you? Do you pause for a second, go, hmm, swish it around like a fine wine? No, you spit it out immediately. You're like, ah! You spew it out of your mouth. It's disgusting. You know, in that moment as I was a kid, that was my superhero origin story because to this day, to this day, I can smell milk going bad from across the house before anybody else can. It's, it's like a power I have. Someone will open their refrigerator for one second, close it, and I'll be like, milk's going bad. Other people are like, no, it's not. I'm like, it's going bad. I won't touch it, right? It's just something about that experience gave me that superpower. But what God is saying here in, in the idea of these verses and this destruction and saying that their destruction is going to come swiftly, they're going to be cut off from salvation, But in their destruction, they will be destroyed. In their ruin, they will be destroyed. What he's saying is, look, what I'm going to do with the false teachers is I'm going to spit them out of my mouth. They're disgusting. They're foul. And as they are ruining other people's lives and bringing decay and and, and, and ruin into other people's lives, I'm going to, they're going to be ruined. I'm just going to spit them out of my mouth. And I think the reason is, is because I don't think there's much more that is offensive to God, as offensive to God, than deception. God is not a fan of deception. He's not a fan of lying, right? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 17, it tells us that God hates the lying tongue. Hates it. God Almighty, creator of the universe, hates the lying tongue. And he says he, he hates the one who gives false testimony. God hates lying. And I don't think there is anything more offensive to God than those who falsify facts about him, who lie about who he is, to lie about what he did when he came, to lie about how to be reconciled to him, our creator. False teachers who enter the true church are going to face certain judgment, certain judgment. And this truth, I think, is meant to help us deal with false teachers, to deal with the fact that false teachers are out there, to deal with the fact that we see them on YouTube and, and social media and TikTok and, and, and to deal with things like progressive Christianity, which is just in a, in, a, in a swell of popularity in our current culture, and yet it is so false. To be able to identify false teachers and to know God's going to deal with them. God's going to deal with them. And I think that's meant to give us, okay, God's going to deal with them. I can, I, can, I can be at peace in the moment. I don't have to overreact. I don't have to become a zealot. I don't have to become a mercenary and hunt them down. I, just God's going to deal with it. God will handle it, so let God handle it. Now, just so we don't misunderstand that, God, through Peter, gives us three illustrations of what he's done in the past to handle it. The first illustration he gives us is dealing with fallen angels. The second illustration is the ancient world in the flood. And the third illustration is Sodom and Gomorrah. So look at verse 4 with me. 2 Peter 2, verse 4. For if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and delivered them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment, and if he didn't spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, when he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly, And if he reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is coming to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the depraved behavior of the immoral, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, his righteous soul was tormented by the lawless deeds he saw and heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who follow polluting desires of the flesh and despise authority. Heavy stuff. But he gives these three examples, right? Because right before that in verse three, he tells us their condemnation pronounced long ago is not idle and their destruction does not sleep. And then he goes on to say, if God didn't spare the angels, if God didn't spare the wicked world, if God didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So let's look at these examples. The first one, God didn't spare the angels who rebelled with the devil and did horrible things on earth, but he cast them into hell. 
Now, Peter referred to this exact thing in his first letter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. He, he's writing, and just kind of almost in passing, he's making a comment about when Jesus died on the cross. He was made alive by the Spirit, or made alive in the Spirit, and then it says, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepare, prepared. So here in his second letter, he, he refers to this thing again as an example of God handling it and God passing judgment on those who, who, who do wrong and lie, and I'm going to talk about that in a second here. But he refers to here in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, the angels who sinned. In 1 Peter, those are the spirits in prison. Jude chapter 6 also refers to these same angels doing wrong and being incarcerated. And so just real quick, he, he says, look, during the days of Noah, there was something really horrible happening on the earth in the midst of all the wickedness that existed in the world, right? Now, we can see what was happening during that time when we go back to Genesis chapter 6 and look at verses 1 and 2 and verse 4, and to summarize all of it, what, what I believe was taking place was that fallen angels were somehow, some way, I can't explain how, but in some some way or method, fallen angels were having sexual relationships with human women. And you could read about that in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And what was happening is these, these, these relationships were producing corrupted, demonic offspring. Now, I, I deal with all of this in great detail. Um, when I taught First Peter chapter 3, uh, I think it was verses 18 through 22, if you want to go into great detail on, on why I believe that, that this is what has taken place, go watch that video, okay? But I'm not going to recap the whole thing here for you. But the idea is that there was this really terrible thing going on with this, these spirits, these angels, having relations with women and producing this demonic offspring. Now, I personally believe that the reason that was happening is was an attempt to corrupt the human genome. And the reason I believe that is because in the very beginning... There was a promise from God. There was a truth spoken by God to the serpent in the garden. And the truth that was spoken is that there was, there was a promised one who would be born, an offspring of Eve who would be born, who would defeat the power of Satan forever. God promised that. It was God's word. He said, this is going to happen. And so if you look through the Old Testament, starting with Cain and Abel, you see Satan tried over and over and over to stop the line, to keep the Messiah from being born. Started with, with Cain and Abel, right? Cain killed Abel. Abel was the righteous one. But that didn't stop it. It came down through Seth. And you go on and on and on and on throughout history. But you get to the time of Noah, and we read about these, these sons of God. Again, I go into detail on that in the other video having relations with women, and having these, these things called Nephilim, great men, um, that were on the land. And it was horrible. It was horrific. And it was, I believe it was an attempt to corrupt the human genome to the point where the Messiah couldn't be born through man, through the seed of Eve. Now, if Satan was able to succeed in that, then God's truth would be a lie, wouldn't it? God said the Messiah will come through the offspring of Eve. But if Satan was able to corrupt, corrupt the genome of humanity, then that couldn't happen. And the angels who participated in this attempt to take God's truth and make it a lie were judged severely. It says they were cast into hell, okay? And again, I go into what that is and the abyss and the prison and all that in the other video. But that's the first example he gives. Those who were trying to make God's promises into a lie, the angels, the fallen angels who did wrong, they sinned, God judged them harshly. Then he says, God didn't spare the wicked, rebellious, fallen humanity of the world in the flood, but destroyed them all, except for eight who believed, Noah and his family. We see this in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, describing the world of Noah's time. It says, human wickedness was widespread on the earth, and every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. That's a pretty bleak description of humanity. The word wickedness there in Genesis 6, 5, it means morally objectable behavior. Objectable to whose morals? God's morals. It's talking about evil, misery, distress, injury. 
And then it says the human mind, the inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. That word evil means uh, disagreeable. The idea of that word is contrary to God's desire. Disagreeable with God's desire. So collectively, it's telling us that during the time of Noah, before the flood, humanity's wickedness was widespread on the earth. That what was happening on the earth at that time, not, this isn't even dealing with what the angels were doing, that, that we already talked about, but just what humanity was doing was, was living opposite of the truth of God's desire for humanity. And God didn't spare the ancient world at this time. He flooded it. Now, thank God that afterwards he said, I'm never going to do that again. And we have the promise that he established the rainbow. It was the covenant that God said, I'm never going to flood the world again. But at that time, he flooded it. And then we have the third example. God didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah, but rained fire upon that place and destroyed it and its people completely. Now we find the story of this happening in Genesis chapter 16. To quickly summarize, two angels show up disguised as men. They look like men. They show up to Sodom and Gomorrah. It tells us there in Genesis 16 that the men of the town, the men of the town wanted to engage in homosexual, sexual relations with these men. Now, that wasn't the only issue in in Sodom and Gomorrah, but it was the big one. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50, tells us another testimony of what was taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, now this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, plenty of food, and comfortable security, but didn't support the poor and needy. They were haughty, and did detestable acts before me. So I removed them when I saw this. Now that word detestable there in Ezekiel, that word detestable in Hebrew means morally disgusting. That's what the word literally means. It's the same exact Hebrew word used in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, which says this, you are not to sleep with a man as with a woman. It is detestable. Jude chapter 7 says this, Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed sexual immorality and perversions and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. The word punishment or perversions there in the Greek, the word literally means homosexual intercourse. So it's very clear what the Bible is talking about was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. They didn't take care of the poor. They didn't take care of the needy. But the main story that is highlighted in Scripture is the men of the town wanted to commit rape, wanted to homosexually rape these two angels. Oh, these new men are in town. Let's go get them. And God said, that's enough. I'm going to destroy that whole place. Now, how is this a distortion of God's truth? Well, in Genesis chapter 2, God established the entire structure of human intimacy and relationship. He created man and woman to complement each other. And then in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh, talking about the, the sexual union between a man and a woman in marriage, in the covenant of marriage. God established it that way. God created it that way. It's how biology works. It's how procreation works. It's what marriage is intended to be, one male and one female, biblically. But because Sodom's entire culture was a lie, was teaching lies, encouraging lies against the truth of what God said it should all be, what God said sexual relationship would be, where it's to be um, exercised and all that, because their whole culture was a lie against that, judgment. Judgment fell upon them. And this is a tough one in our culture today, right? The culture war has been going on for 15 years now or so, aggressively long before that. And the fight over homosexual marriage and same-sex couples and, and all this stuff. And now there's, like, there's, there's, there's no sexes and genders, but, but we want same-sex marriage. Well, are there sexes or no sexes? I'm so confused. I think they are too. But the point is, it's this whole world of taking what God created as, as, as the intention, one man, one woman, bonded together in marriage, one flesh, it's talking about that sexual union, and perverting it. 
And Sodom was judged for that because it perverted the truth of what God had established and set up. Now these three judgments, they were total. They were severe. They were complete. And so the idea for us, I think, and reason the Holy Spirit wrote this and, and wants us to read it, and it's in the word for us to study, is so that we don't think any false teacher will get a free pass when it comes to judgment. To never think they're going to get a free pass. What this chapter is teaching is if a false teacher stays in false teaching and insists on it, their judgment is coming. Their judgment is coming, and it's going to be severe. It's going to be severe. Now again, why is God so punitive towards false teachers? Why is Peter so descriptive in the punishments here? Because it really, really does matter what we consume when it comes to truth, what we ingest, what we take into, you know, what we take into our lives, what we listen to, what we watch, what we meditate on when it comes to the truth of God is critically important. It is critically important because it can bring you life and life eternal or it can destroy you and lead to everlasting destruction. Truth leads to life. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no person is what he means there comes to the Father but through me. There's no other road. It's very narrow, very specific, very exclusive, but available to everyone. Everyone that would accept the truth of God's word can, can find salvation and the promise of eternal life. But this is why the language is, 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 that is used here, the, the, this is why the language is employed so harshly, so critical, because that truth, that truth means everything. You can have everything right, everything right, but then go, but Jesus isn't God. Well, if Jesus isn't God, then there's no, there's no sacrifice, there's no salvation. Yeah, but I got all this other stuff right. I think that's why in the Old Covenant they said, you sin in one area of the law, you're guilty of breaking all of it. The penalty's the same. That's why truth is so important. Even a subtle mix of truth with error can be very, very harmful. I read a story of a farmer who once was just, uh, he was just over the rising cost of oats, right? He was just done with it. The cost of oats is going up and, and I'm sick of it. But he had mules and he wanted to feed his mules, right? The, he needed to keep them happy and he thought, hmm, I'm going to beat the system. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take less oats per meal and I'm going to fill in the balance of it with sawdust. And I'm going to feed that to my mules. Ha, I beat the system. Right? And his mules started to eat this half oats, half sawdust stuff they were given. And by the time they were full, by the time they were satisfied, they were dead. They were dead. It's the same with so-called truth that is really error. It might start out mm, seeming okay. This isn't so bad. But what God is trying to tell us is that over time, it will destroy. It will destroy. So beware of the lies of the false teachers. Be able to spot them, be able to identify, and that was last week's study. And be sure of their future. Know that God knows, and God will hold them accountable. That, that, that the harm they have wrought, assuming they don't repent and change their ways, they, they will get what's coming to them. And, and that's what he's saying here. The final thing I want to look at that helps us in dealing with false teachers, especially that helps us to, to, to not fall into false teaching or to be led astray by a false teacher, is to be aligned with the faithful. Be aligned with the faithful. Be connected to the faithful. You see, right in the middle of these three judgments that he illustrates, right, the angels, the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, right in the middle of that, he, he describes two people that serve as wonderful examples of individuals who escaped the judgment. Noah and Lot. Neither one of them were perfect people. 
You go read their stories, you find out, wow, okay, they're pretty messed up dudes, right? They're not perfect people. They each had their own issues and struggles. But we find of Noah, it says, when, when God flooded the ancient world, what it tells us in Second in Peter 2, 5, is that he protected Noah. He protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. That's what it says there. He didn't spare the ancient world, but he protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. And so Noah preached a message. And that message was a message of righteousness. We could read about this in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. It tells us who this man was. It says Noah was a righteous man, that he was blameless, that he walked with God, it says there. And the word righteous, preacher of righteousness, Noah was a righteous man. That word righteous in there, it means that he followed God's morality. Or to put it another way, he followed God's truth about what was right, what was wrong, what was good, what was evil. And he preached that message. He was a preacher of the same righteousness. And again, his message was very narrow, very narrow. The Bible tells us that he preached for 120 years or so while he was building the ark, 100 to 120, depending on who you talk to, but the whole time he's building this boat, there's never been a worldwide flood. And he's preaching righteousness. He's preaching to this fallen world, this wicked world, right, where it says that human wickedness had spread over the whole world. And the inclination of the human mind was only evil all the time. And he's over there preaching righteousness, preaching God's way, preaching living according to God's standard. And nobody wanted to listen to him. Nobody wanted to listen to him. But we just read earlier in 2 Peter that, 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 that or was it in 2 Peter? I forget the verse. But it says God was, was patient while he was building the ark. He was patient with the world while, God was, while, while Noah was building the ark. I love that. Just like today. We'll look around the world today and we're like, God, when are you going to pull the plug? This world's dark. This world's evil. This world's, some of the stuff you hear about that people do, you're like, I didn't think it could get worse. And then, I, oh my gosh, I didn't think it could get worse. And these horrible, horrible things. And yet, while we're out there preaching righteousness and preaching Christ, which the ark is a type of, God is being patient with the world. Because he wants everybody to have the opportunity to get saved. And so he preached for 120 years, and, and you can imagine what others might have said about him during that time, right? They're out there doing these perverse things and these wicked things and debauchery, and they're just like, you know, this guy's so intolerant. He's so judgmental. How dare he say there is only one way to escape God's judgment on sin? How dare he say that this boat is the only means of salvation? How dare he say that? But he was right. He was right. It was God's truth. And then 2 Peter 2, 7, we get to Lot. It says, he rescued righteous Lot, who was distressed by the depraved behavior of the immoral. For, that as, a right, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, his righteous soul was tormented by the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. So Lot is the second example of one who escaped judgment, right? How is Lot rescued? We read about this in Genesis chapter 19. Again, we touched on the story already. These two angels show up to Sodom and Gomorrah. They, they go in there, and it says they go into the town square, and Lot pleads with them. Lot says, guys, please, please, please come stay at my house. And they're like, no, we're going to sleep in the square. And he's like, no, please, please come stay at my house. Why? Because he knew what the place was like. He knew what the people were like there. He knew what the men of the city would do to these guys if they tried to stay out in the square. And so he begged them, come stay in my house. And it says right there, he rescued righteous Lot who was distressed by the depraved behavior of the immoral. That word distressed means distress caused through, oppress uh, through oppressive means. Distress caused through oppressive means. The picture of that is that he was treated poorly by the people there because of his stance against their behavior. Sound familiar? Let me put it in modern day words. How dare you have a business where you make cakes unless you will or unless you don't say. How dare you preach Christ? How dare you say this? How dare... We're going to shut you down. We're going to close your business. We're going to get you fired. We're going to, 
It's happening today. But these men of the city, or the men of the city, after Lot convinced these two angels, please come to my house, they came to his house. The men of the city showed up at Lot's door, started banging on the door and demanded. And it says in Genesis, demanded, hand them over so that we can have sex with them. That's what it says in Genesis. Lot begged the men of the city, please don't do this. He was distressed over the behavior that he was seeing as he lived there. The men of the city proceeded to try and break into the house and take these angels forcefully. And then the story goes on, the angels struck them all blind and then told Lot, look, get your family and flee this city because God is going to destroy it. What did Lot do? He believed that what God said he was going to do, he was going to do. And he got his family and he fled the city. Lot had issues. Lot made some really bad decisions. Lot stumbled. Lot messed up constantly. Even in that very story, the the men of the city are banging on the door. Give us those men so we can have sex with them. And this is what Lot does, right? Not father of the year. My daughters, who have never been with a man, I'll give them to you, but leave these men alone. Like, thanks, Dad. Lot was, was not the best person. But what he did do is he believed God. He believed God. He believed God's word. And here, the Bible, God through Peter calls him righteous. Calls him righteous. Why? Because he believed God. Same as Abraham, right? What does it say about Abraham in Genesis? He believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. I think Peter's point in including these two guys in the midst of the description of judgment on false teachers, um, the point of that to, to say, look, these two guys escaped the promised judgment of their time. Follow their example how. I think that's the point, right? I think that's the point. Why? Well, verse 9, 2 Peter 2, he says, because the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. We know we're not godly. I know I'm not godly on my own. But in Christ, God sees us as sinless perfection. In Christ, we are washed clean. In Christ, we are godly, righteous people. And in Christ, and because of Christ, we are in a place for God to rescue us from trials. Now, I like this verse a lot because for me, it shows a theological pattern of God's judgment. Notice, God rescues the godly before he ruins the ungodly. Take note of that. When wrath comes from God directly in Scripture, he always rescues the godly before he pours out the wrath. He lifted up Noah and his family above the judgment that was taking place on the earth, on the ark. The ark was a type of Christ. I believe Noah being lifted up above all of it is a type of, you know, when we're in Christ. Because we're in Christ, we'll be lifted above the judgment that God is going to pour out on the earth. This is why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Over and over throughout Scripture, we see this picture of God taking the godly out before he pours his wrath out on the ungodly. But that's a whole other Bible study. The idea, though, is that it follows his pattern. It follows God's pattern. So let me close with two thoughts. First thought, looking at last week's message and this week's message together, and if you don't remember last week's, go back and listen to it, okay? Remember two times to get 25% retention? We talked about that. So when we consider the harshness of the language and the, the severe descriptions of judgment that are given here, we have to understand that it's because God loves us enough to give us the warning. God loves you and I enough to warn us about false teaching, about false teachers. He loves us enough to, to detail, 
what is coming upon false teachers, to warn us against false teaching. He loves us enough to warn us. He loves us enough to tell us this truth because false teaching leads to false living, which results in false hope, which ultimately leads to a false salvation. So don't get caught up in it. Don't be a part of it. Watch out for it. The second thought is I believe God wants us to find faithful people as examples to emulate. Faithful people as examples to emulate. You know, um, I, I do find it interesting that Lot is one of the examples here, right? So that God doesn't set the bar real high. <laughs> Righteous Lot. All right. You know, he doesn't expect perfection out of us. He, he doesn't expect any of that. What he expects us is to believe him. To, to endeavor to walk in obedience. We stumble. We fall. We mess up. Thank God that it's his righteousness imputed to us. But looking at the example of these two guys, Noah built an ark. God said, a flood is coming. Noah said, okay, I'm going to build a boat. And then he warned others. Judgment's coming. The whole world's going to be flooded. Come on, Noah. That's never happened before. It's God said it. Lot believed God enough to run out of Sodom. Family, let's go. Let's get out because God's judgment is coming. And I'm sure they're both glad they did because they both knew that when God makes a promise, that he's going to act on that promise, guaranteed. And the wonderful truth of God's word is that no matter what, right now, here in this room, or watching this video later, even if you've been caught up in false teaching, even if you're just realizing you're a false teacher, if you believe Jesus right now, if you're willing to step away from what you think is true or what you know isn't true and are still teaching it anyways, and instead believe in what he says about himself, Believe God's truth about who Jesus is. Believe that he came to this earth to die for your sins. Believe that, that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. And that through faith in him alone, through belief in what God says in his word, you will be saved. If you'll believe that, you can be saved right now. God will save you. So let's pray. And if you don't know him, if you've been caught up in false teaching, if you've been dabbling in this stuff, I'm just going to pray that, that God would just break those chains of that and set you free from that right now. Lord, God, we thank you, Lord. Lord, there's times where, where, where your word is heavy. There's times where your, your word is, 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 can be difficult. The Lord is our heavenly Father, one who is holy and just and true. God, you are full of grace and full of mercy and full of forgiveness. You love us desperately. But God, you also take truth very seriously. And as we saw, Jesus, when you were here on earth and, and overturned the money changers' tables and, and made a whip and <laughs> drove the people that were misrepresenting you out of the temple, God, you take truth about who you are very seriously. And so, God, we pray, Lord, that you would keep our eyes wide open, that we'd be able to identify false teachers and stay away from their teaching because it's only going to lead to destruction. That God, as we run across people, friends, family, or whatever, who are, who are caught up in or dabbling in or, or maybe just starting the, the transition of, of, of embracing false teaching, Lord, that we would have an opportunity to encourage them back to truth, back to the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God. Lord, if anybody in this room tonight has, has been teaching falsehoods about you, about what your Word says, And you've revealed that to them tonight, that they've been lying about you. I pray, God, that they would know that right here in this moment, you're extending forgiveness to them. You're extending grace to them. 
And Lord, I pray that the warning that is to come on false teachers, God, would just be a catalyst of change. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray change would take place. And if, if you're here and you've been buying into falsehoods, teaching falsehoods, leading falsely about who God is, just tell God you're sorry. Just repent. Let the Holy Spirit speak truth in your heart and then follow it, obey it. Let's strive to, to, to be righteous as Noah is righteous. Even if the extent of that is, is, is even living in an unholy place and being surrounded by unholy people, that we would believe that God says what he says, that he's going to do what he says he's going to do, and we would be like Lot and just believe enough to get out. Because, Lord, we know judgment's coming on this world. But help us, God, to be preachers of righteousness in the meantime, God, to save as many as we can before that judgment comes. To be beacons of light, the light of truth in this world, God, because we're surrounded by so much falsehood. Help us to be bold in truth, to stand for truth, just like Noah did for 120 years. Nobody wanted to hear what he had to say, but he still preached truth. Help us to be people who do that. That we wouldn't be ever caught up in the lies of false teachers, but set free to stand against those things, that people would be truly saved, truly redeemed, set free with the hope of eternal life. God, we thank you and we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Let's worship.